It's so good to have our bishop, Bishop Mullings, with us here today. Amen. And uh, we want him to come and we want him to minister the word of God, however the Lord leads him. Let's just receive Bishop Mullings here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. God bless everybody. Amen. It is such a delight to be here. I concur with Pastor about worship. Talked to a man a few years ago and he was never able just to turn loose to worship God. He said, I'm afraid I'd be in the flesh. I told him, I said, Well, I don't know about you, but that's all I've got to worship God with is my flesh. I've never seen a spirit dance. And while I'm preaching, if a spirit comes dancing down that center aisle, that door is mine. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor, Sister Delgado, thank you for your incredible kindness. It's almost embarrassing. They are so kind to me. And uh, their great children, Alex and Michael and Annalise, I love them. I kind of adopted them as kind of my step grandkids. I don't know if they like it. They don't have any choice in it. So. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, praise singers, praise team. I preach a lot of places, and it's so refreshing to see praise leaders that praise. Isn't that a novel concept? Instead of just perform. So thank you. You ministered to me today, and I, I really appreciate it. This is July the 21st, 2019. On July the 20th, 1958, a little 13-year-old kid in Bakersfield, California, was filled with the Holy Ghost. 61 years ago, the Lord gave me the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and it has not gotten old. If the Lord will help me today, I want to move very quickly into the word of the Lord. I know you got roasts in the oven or whatever. I don't, do people still do that on Sundays? I don't know. Okay, good. All right. Okay, are you are the, afraid the Baptists will beat us to the cafeteria or something? So I will try to redeem the time. I will be very honest with you over the last while I've had to be honest with myself and understand that my preaching is greatly influenced by my age. I'm living in my 74th year. It doesn't take a road scholar to know that my use by date is not that far out there. And so uh, I don't have time to play scriptural hide and seek with you folks. I don't have enough more chances to afford to let you leave here saying, I wonder what that man was really trying to say. So uh, if you are a guest here, I also am a guest speaker. Uh, don't hold him responsible for it. Come back next Sunday and he'll show you what real preaching is. But if you have your Bibles and want to go with me today, two passages of scripture from the revelation of John chapter 12. And then the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Same writer, writing about the same individual, but in a little different measure. Revelations chapter 12, verse number 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. John chapter 10, verse number 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. If the Lord would help me for a little while today, I want to preach to you just simply on the thief. Now, I want to thank the sound man in advance. I am a sound man's nightmare. I am either screaming or whispering. And 
I, I feel sorry for apostolic sound men because they can't really get in the service. They've got to be so in tune with what's going on in that microphone. So thank you, fellas, in advance. I appreciate it. The only time anybody ever notices them is when they don't get it right, and that's a sad thing. So thank you, fellas. Everybody, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Say thank you, Jesus. Praise now just say something on your own and listen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. This hour that we live in, of all the ages and, and generations that have come and gone in, in my lifetime, in my ministry, this is at, at once the most incredibly promising hour the church has ever experienced. And at the same time, it is the most frightening hour in my life. We are and have the most gifted, talented, capable ministries that I have ever seen. Music, pulpit, organizational structure, all of that. We have education, we have, we have intelligence, we have intellect, and those present one of the most incredible opportunities to enhance the kingdom that I've ever seen. And yet, at the same time, they present an incredible opportunity to fall short of the glory of the Lord. Into this hour, an individual is injecting himself. First Peter 5, 8, he said, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. You have to understand some things. Number one, he is your personal adversary. And by saying that, you need to realize that that this term, the devil, is not simply a concept that we have developed. It's not simply a terminology way that we explain evil in the world. He is very, very real. And don't ever mistake who your enemy is. He would love to establish an adversarial role between the pulpit and the pew today. The preacher is not your enemy. He may tell you when you're wrong. He may tell you what you need to do to be right, but he's doing it out of love. He Do not be like, like Ahab when he looked at Elijah as he comes to condemn him for stealing Naboth's vineyard and declare, oh, my enemy, thou hast found me. That man is not your enemy. But don't ever mistake who you're... Not. Spiritual authority is a must in anybody's life. Anybody that makes it to heaven is going to have the fingerprints of some man of God all over their soul. In fact, when the, the Roman centurion came to Jesus and, and, and appealed that he would heal his servant, Jesus said, fine, let's go. He said, no, I, you don't have to go with me. I'm a man of authority. I'm a man under authority. I under, how, understand how authority works. I, I get this subjection idea. I know when to be in subjection. I know when to exercise authority. And Jesus looked at him and said, that's the greatest faith I've found in, in, in my ministry. An understanding of spiritual authority and submission and subjection is one of the greatest attributes of faith that there is in the Bible, but he is your adversary and he is seeking. He does come, he will come against you. And the Bible says he comes with wrath. The word that's translated wrath there is a Greek word which speaks of passion and it's an intense passion, an intense and a violent feeling. I wanna tell you something today. You may hear, be here in this service and, and it may just be another date on your calendar. You may not be passionate about this service. You may not be passionate about your relationship with God. You may not be passionate about your soul, but I promise you there is one that is among us that is very passionate about this service. He's very passionate about your soul. He's very passionate about you. And I think one of the, hell is not complacent. I want you to know, whatever hell does, it does with passion. It's sad that sometimes we apostolics can get more emotional about a trip to Disneyland or Six Flags than we do about a journey to the house of God. We put more timing, more, more planning, more effort and organization into a trip to, to see Mickey than we do to see Jesus. Hallelujah. 
And you need to understand something. The devil is here and he is passionate and he has a lot of weapons at his disposal and they are all dirty. He is dishonorable. He is unethical. And because of that, it puts the ministry at a disadvantage because we must be honorable and we must be ethical. And then you add to that equation that the flesh is, is, is spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak and the devil will use that against you. And there are many ways that his passion is displayed when he comes against you. The first and foremost is he is a liar. John 8 and 44 said not only is he a liar, he is the father of it. And the, the, the dirty thing about his lies is sometimes they will be so very close to the truth that if you're not careful, you will not recognize them as a lie. The devil injected three letters into a commandment of God that changed the whole destiny of mankind. He said, thou shalt not surely die. And pastor, that changed the destiny of the world that we live in. A, just a three-letter lie, just so subtle, so not, not, a, not a glaring difference, but, but he is a liar, and, 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 and he, he comes against us. And in fact, 1 Timothy 4, 1 talks about this hour when there will be seducing spirits. The word that's translated seducing there comes from a, a Greek word in the noun tense. It speaks of a hobo or a vagabond. There'll be hobo, vagabond spirits that will try to insinuate themselves into your relationship with God. A hobo is somebody that has no fixed abode. They, they have no permanent dwelling place. Can I tell you something? The devil does not care. He doesn't mind you being here. He doesn't mind you enjoying the singing. He doesn't even mind you enjoying my preaching today as long as he can convince you that the truth that I'm preaching is not absolute. He, won't, he doesn't have to, have to tell you that I'm not preaching truth as long as he can convince you that it is not an absolute truth. There are other truths. A hobo is irresponsible. And if he can get the spirit of a hobo or vagabond in you, a hobo does his own thing. He has no feeling of responsibility. He's not answerable to any man. There's no regimen in his life. There's no discipline in his life. He lives a feel-good lifestyle. And if the devil, he, he, if, he can, if he can get that seducing spirit to, to entertain you, and, and that's why in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 said, for in the, in the last days, men will not endure sound doctrine, but they'll heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears and turn away from the truth unto fable. The word that's endure is just simply the word to put up with. I'm sorry, not everything that comes across this pulpit is going to be enjoyable, but it's going to be necessary. And, and it may even be offensive at times, but if you're going to be saved, you're going to put up with some stuff. They'll not endure sound doctrine. It comes from the, the Greek word to be whole or to be absolute. I'm sorry, Acts 2.38 is not a way to be saved. It is the way to be saved. I'm sorry, holiness is not optional. Now, nobody's going to heaven because of anything they didn't wear, any place they didn't go. Holiness will not save you, but it is the homage that God requires of us because he has saved us. He said to be turned from the truth to fables. Fables are kind of like, they're almost pretty good. That's good enough. I know it's not quite 10%, but it's pretty good. It's good enough. I... Hello? But he is a liar. But what we need is voices today to stand forward and say, this is the way. Walk in it. Hallelujah. By our lives, by our attitudes, by our values. Declare this is the way. And that's the calling to this generation. So it's for, he's a liar. But secondly, he's an accuser of the brethren. Doesn't mean he points fingers and, and charges you with all. The word accuser there, it comes from the verb in the Greek to single out or to isolate or to turn against. He fights dirty. Matthew 13 talks about the parable of the, of the fields and the sower and the seed and the wheat and the tares. And I told you, you he straightened this out Wednesday night. But Matthew 13 said, the tares are the children of the wicked one. 
They, they are sown between the wheat. They divide the wheat. They, and I'm going to tell you what. The, I've already swallowed the cat. There ain't no point gagging on his tail. The devil will put people in the church just like that to get between you and a brother, to get between you and the pastor. The, he, hello? And the sad thing is, I, I, am, I come from farm country and, and the only difference, in their early st- sprouting stages, t- wheat and tares are, are so similar in their appearance. The only time you can really tell the difference is when it comes to bearing fruit. But a tear will rob the soil of its nutrients. A tear will suck the vitality right out of the pastor. That's why you need to you need to understand the nature of a tear, and you need to be you need to understand the nature of the real thing. Galatians said, "The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against us there is no law." You need to be careful who you're receiving counsel from. If you're not careful, you'll be like some that Ezekiel talked about when he said they, they, they bear no difference in the holy and the profane. You need to be careful who you listen to. Hello? You're not, Second Peter said, you'll be led away by the error of the wicked. The word error there is just a Greek word for fraud. Whatever works, that's what the devil will use. If hurt feelings will do it, he'll make sure you get your feelings hurt. If a lack of involvement will do it, he'll make sure you're too busy to get involved. If an offense will do it, he'll make sure somebody's the offender. In fact, he even may make you the offender. Because he wants to separate. He wants to isolate. That's why every once in a while you just need to go down the road singing that little Sunday school song, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful. His third characteristic, he's a murderer. The sad thing is, 1 John 3, 15 said, he that hateth his brother is a murderer, and no murderer hath eternal life in him. And so on, he's a tempter. I'm going to tell you, he is is a master. The devil will, will come at you and, and, and you will resist, whom resist steadfast in the faith. But he has this knack. He, he, will, he will gouge and press and prod and push and, and you will resist. But I don't care who you are. I don't care how close to God you are. There will come a point that the devil will plunge and you'll wince. And he'll say, okay, I found my soft spot now. And he will begin to work on you and he will zero in on that thing. And, and if, it's, if, it's your, if your feelings are a little too sensitive, he will make sure everybody you talk to says something that you deem is offensive. If, it, hello, hallelujah. But he will jab and jab until you flinch and then, and then he will bore in. He, he, will, he is a polluter. He will, he'll corrupt your values. Can I, you know one of the, the phrases that bothers me in this generation more than anything else, Pastor, that's people saying, what's the difference in? You know what? I don't always know what the difference is, but God does. Now, there's something I do know what the difference is. Somebody said, what's the difference in a woman's calf and her thigh? It's a big difference. Well, I'm sorry. Did I say something wrong? I don't understand why. Somebody said, explain to me why that's wrong. I'm not God. Maybe, maybe some of us in there, just because God's got this funny idea, his people ought to be different. He is a counterfeiter. He will come in, in a measure that is so much like the spirit of the Lord. Hello? Hello? And sometimes it's hard to know if it's counterfeit or not. You ever notice you go to the the store and you hand them a large bill, what's the first thing they do? They hold it up to the light because it's got to have that little strip in it. And so whenever something is, is, is working at you and you, and you, I'm not sure if this is real or not, hold it up to the light. Take it to the word of God. See... But he is. He's a thief. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's a tempter. 
He's a polluter. He's a counterfeiter. The thing that's important for you to understand is he is, in Matthew 13 and 19, said he is the wicked one and you are the object of his wicked designs right here, even in the house of God. While I'm preaching, he's here. He's working on some of you. Just like Zechariah 3 and 1 said, the Lord showed me Satan, Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan was right there trying to resist him, even here in the presence of God. But the key is where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now that doesn't mean you're automatically gonna be loose, but it means there is the ability, there's the opportunity to be loose from every negative influence and every negative force. And you gotta understand, you can resist him steadfast in the faith. But he has come, and he's come with wrath, great passion. And John said he comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. He doesn't come just to annoy. He doesn't come just to pester. He comes to steal. It's actually the Greek word to filch, which is a very subtle thing, sneaky subtle. It's kind of like a burglar. We got this idea that for the devil to steal from us has always got to be this violent confrontation. But the devil, it's not always like armed robbery. Sometimes he will simply catch you in a moment of inattention or in one of those dry seasons that we all go through. And during those times, he, and he's, he, he's patient. He doesn't have to have everything in your house if he can just during this dry season or this moment of inattention just come and, and burgle you and take the joy of the Lord. He'll leave you sitting right here in church with your commitment, with your apostolic identity, with your... But before long, he, he comes back and he'll, 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 he'll take your contentment. Can I tell you something? It troubles me to see so many discontented Christians today. <laughs> Hello? But the devil is trying to steal your contentment. He, then he'll come back for your faithfulness. And then, and then it's, he, it, you are gone long before you forfeit your apostolic identity. Because he comes to steal. He comes to destroy. It's actually two words in the Greek. It means to separate and to reverse. That's why Paul wrote to the Galatians in 5.7 and said, you did run well. What did hinder? And the word hinder there is to set back or to turn around. How many of you came into this apostolic faith out of the world? You weren't raised in. Then, then can I ask you a question? If the world made you happy, why are you here? If the world didn't make you happy before, it's not gonna make you happy now. So I don't care how rough it gets, just suck it up and live for God. Comes to destroy and he comes to kill. It's not just murder, it's, it's the word to immolate, which is to offer something as a sacrificial offering. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The devil wants to turn that around. He wants to take your life. He wants to make you not a trophy to God. He wants to make you a trophy of hell. And I'm gonna tell you what, the longer you've been in church, the more steadfast you are, the more settled you are, the bigger target you've got on, his, on your back. You think this is only for new converts and only for those that are not strong in the faith. When a, when a hunter goes out after, after a trophy game, he, he, he may pass up the, the two-pointer. He may pass up the four-pointer. He's looking for that 10-point or that 12-point buck because he wants a trophy to hang on his wall. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't care how long you've lived for God, you better understand that we have an adversary. There's a thief in this room. He wants to steal, to kill, to destroy. He wants to make you a trophy of hell. You, you're never old enough you don't need to pray. You don't need to be in the house of God. You don't need to be preached to. And when it says he, he comes to kill, it's in the progressive tense of the verb. It's subtle. It's not always a sudden thing. It's an ongoing thing. That's why the, the wise man said, where there's no vision, the people perish. The word that's translated vision there is a 
a Hebrew word. It doesn't speak of a foretelling or a foretelling. It's, it, it, it's really just the word of perception, the ability to see the big picture. And he said, you lose the ability to see the big picture, but you don't understand they hurt my feelings. Get over it. Well, the pastor was pretty harsh the other night. Well, get over it. It's a harsh world. Hell's harsh. Don't lose big picture. This isn't about right now. You say, I'm going through a tough time. I'm sorry, but it isn't about right now. But I don't feel like God's being fair. Well, he's not fair. Nowhere in the Bible does it say he's fair. He is just, though. But it's not about right now. But I'm not happy. God doesn't care whether you're happy. He wants to see you there when the saints go marching in. the big picture because if you do the Bible says you'll perish and I don't know why it's translated that it's not the word to die the word that's translated perish is a Hebrew word which means literally means to disrobe or take your clothes off but I understand that because pastor if you lose the ability to see the big picture then you become prey to that thief We've all seen it happen. If you've been in church very long, you've seen somebody. Maybe they go through a, a, an unfortunate circumstance or, or maybe they have a clash or conflict with a pastor. If you're going to live for God more than three days, you're probably going to have a conflict with your pastor because he's going to preach things you don't like and you don't want to hear. The French have a word for that. It's tough. But I've seen people go through those things and, and they lose sight of the big picture. They get focused on that one irritant or that one, and, and, and I've seen them, they, they begin to pair, they begin to disrobe. You see them walk through the doors of the house of God, and my goodness, they don't have the joy of the Lord anymore. And, and then, and then the, the next time they come, they, they've, they've lost their contentment, and, and then their peace that passes under, until finally they still have the apostolic identity, but they're spiritually naked, and everybody knows it but them. Genesis says he's more subtle than anything God ever created. I'm going to let you in on a secret, honey. He's been the devil a long time, and he is really getting good at it. And I am sorry, I am not, pastor is not, nobody here is a match for him. We need God. We need the church. That's why Hebrews 12, 15 said, looking diligently, lest any man fail the word fail is to become deficient, fail of the grace of God. Listen to me. The devil is come. He is here. He is subtle. He's not here just to irritate you or to aggravate you. He comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, and, and, and you are his objective. He came to Judas. You say, well, you don't have to worry about me, Bishop. He came to Judas. Judas was one of the 12. He carried the purse. He was trusted. He was a disciple. And yet John said the devil put it in his heart to betray Jesus. He also came to Peter. Jesus acknowledged it. Simon, Satan that desired. Oh, that's not really what it said. The word that's translated desired is the Greek word for demand. He said Satan has demanded to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care who you are. There will be a time he will get his hands on you and he will try to sift. And he's not trying to sift out your joy, I mean your faithfulness. He's trying to sift out everything that's good and, and, and leave you discontented and disquieted and despondent and aggravated at God and aggravated at the pastor, and aggravated at the church. And, and that sifting is a gradual thing. First your faithfulness, then your submission, then your righteousness, then your commitment to holiness. And eventually he will sift your reverence for the church and, and your reverence for the man of God until finally you don't even reverence God anymore. And then finally he will sift your apostolic identity, your parents. The first thing he steals is your purpose. Christianity just becomes a sideline. Christianity is not something I do. It's what I am. Yeah. 
I am never not a Christian. It's not about a Sunday and a Wednesday deal. If I'm at Disneyland, I'm a Christian. If I'm at the beach, I'm a Christian. If I'm driving down the highway, I'm a Christian. Yeah. This is not about performance, it's a state of being. I am never not a Christian. That is my purpose. And he will sift your reverence, your fear of the, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the loss of that fear surely is the beginning of stupidity. He will sift your passion. You know, we don't understand how he works so often. He will, it will begin with perhaps a gentle nudge. Maybe we go through a couple of dry services. However, can I submit to you there are no dry services, there are only dry servants. If the servant gets wet, the service will be wet. And it'll just ease and nudge and push and until finally the stage is set for his wrath to be exposed. And that's why it, it always seems so sudden. You know, when people lose out with God, it just, Pastor, it almost always seemed like it was just overnight. But it wasn't. He just nudged here and he pushed there and he prodded there. And it, it's just like Judas. He didn't begin selling Jesus for 30 pieces. It all began with just a, a little critical spirit. As the woman broke the alabaster box and poured it out on Jesus, and he said, mm, my goodness, what a waste. We could have took that and fed a lot of poor folk. Waste? She poured it out on God incarnate in the flesh. Waste? Well, you don't, you don't need to be so fanatical about being a Christian. What am I going to be fanatical about? He ended up with his bowels gushed out. He was immolated. He was made that day a trophy of hell. And you know what breaks my heart? To this day, he still is a trophy of hell. Ephesians 6, 12 said, We wrestle not against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm really, I'm really not worried about principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. They're all without. I got enough confidence in our pastor that but he said to also wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I know I, I battle it. The first thing that comes to your mind is the White House or the calls of Congress, and God knows that's true. But can I submit to you, there is no higher place in the world than the church of the living God. And so it should not surprise us it should not discourage us that once in a while we've got to combat spiritual wickedness right here in the house of God. And when we know that's going on, bless your heart, when that pastor steps in his pulpit and with all the love he can muster, said, I love you, but you ain't bringing that spirit in here. You're not bringing that stuff in here. You better not resent it. You better get on your feet. You better clap your hands. You better amen the preacher. You has come Jesus told Peter I've prayed for you that your faith fail you not young people everybody under 25 in this building stand would you You're under 25 I'm going to tell you something that you've got a target on your back you have a target on your back my ministry is I mean, I'm not ancient, but I don't have to stand on tiptoes to see the runway out there. 
My ministry is getting ready to come in for a landing. Your engines are just revving up. You're fixing to release the brake and, and hit that runway going. And the devil wants to stymie you before you ever get off the ground. You better learn right now. You, you, mama can't pray for you. Daddy can't pray for you. Pastor can't pray for you. You better establish a prayer life. You better take an un, un, You better get a stranglehold on understanding what holiness is all about. You better understand that Acts 2.38 is not a saving message. It's the saving message. You better understand that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Understand! Or you will become a trophy of hell. Thank you. Your ministry is ready to soar, and so he's making you a focus. Titus said, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Paul wrote to the Ephesians said you're saved by grace through faith the problem is faith comes by hearing the word of the Lord you better make going to church a priority daddy daddy hear me if it's church night and your teenage daughter walks in and says, are we going to church tonight? You got a problem. What in the world would ever give her the idea you might not be going to church tonight other than the fact you don't always go? Pastor, I had a preacher call me one time. There was a young man that backslid out of his church and he... He had moved to our city and he was working a job. He said, would you mind going by and just inviting him to church? And I did. I went and talked. Very kind, very, very polite young man. I invited him to church. And I said, you need to be in church, son. He said, well, I appreciate your concern, Brother Mullings, but said, if church was such a big deal, how come growing up our family didn't go half the time? Okay, I'm, I'm landing. I need some mood music up here. <laughs> there is a secret formula in the Bible that I have found for succeeding and defeating the devil. It, it is profound takes a lot of spiritual insight to understand it. But if you really try hard enough, all of you can. It's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse number 10. It said, when sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You got to learn how to tell the devil no. There is not a ruse he can present to you. There is not a challenge he can present to you. There's not a test he can make you go through that's simply looking at him and saying, no, won't take care of it. In fact, in Ephesians 4.27, Paul said, neither give place to the devil. Now, I'm... I'm going to hit some of you where it hurts right now. The word that's translated place is literally the Greek word for a scabbard. In case some of you are not outdoors people, a scabbard is a, sh a sheath, a holder that is made to fit a specific knife in. Like a hunting, that, that leather thing, that's a scabbard. And it's made for that knife. It won't take a knife bigger than that. If you put my smaller than that, it would probably fall out. And so Paul said, don't create a scabbard in your life for the devil. Don't, let me tell you, there is, no, there is no natural place in any Christian's life where the devil fits. You've got to create that place. And if you don't create that place, 
He can't get in. That's why it says resist him steadfast in the faith. There are two phrases that should never be uttered in the same breath by a Christian. That is, I know the Bible teaches, but I think. I've seen one in a while. Used to, you saw a lot of them. Bumper st- Anybody ever see that bumper sticker said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it? That's wrong. God said it, that settles it. Don't make any difference whether you believe it or not. Paul said in Ephesians 4 that we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing. The word conformed there does not speak of an outward appearance or a regimen of dress, and we don't need to be conformed. to the world, But it, it, it really speaks of a regimen of thought. That don't adopt the value systems of this world. Don't adopt the I understand some of the testimonies and I understood what you mean, but can I just be transparent today? We need to understand something about the blessings of God. The blessings of God cannot be stolen. They can't burn up. They can't wear out. I have a very comfortable, nice home, but that's not a blessing. Now, David did say God daily loads us with benefits. I have a good car. That's not a blessing. I have a little bit of money in the bank. That's not a blessing. The blessings of God are righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost. If houses are a blessing of God, he is a respecter of person. If cars are a blessing of God, he is a respecter of person. I thank God for the benefits. I've had a little bit. I've had nothing. It's a whole lot more fun to have a little bit. But all of this stuff that we are so hot on and, and, and we call blessings to God is just junk. He's going to burn it all up someday. But the blessings of the Lord are going with me beyond the grave, beyond the rapture, beyond the... Per- we need an old-fashioned revival of the zeal of the Lord of hosts. We need to get passionate about this thing. <clears throat> now, I, I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm at about the thousand foot level. I'm about to land. I've dealt with people, Pastor, that I knew were going through something. and I go try to talk to them. They say, oh, Brother Mullins, I know it's just the devil. I said, what? Just the devil? You know you're under attack from the devil and you can flippantly say, He doesn't come to agitate or to aggravate or to irritate. He only comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Brother, if you're here today and you're you're in some kind of a situation, don't say it's just the devil. You better make your way to an altar and you better stay there until you pray through to the passion and the glory of God because he is your adversary and he only comes to steal, to kill. And to destroy. Samson the thief came to him. And he stole so much. Thank God he came to himself before it was too late. If you read heaven's roll call of faith in Hebrews 11, he's there. He paid an incredible price that he didn't have to pay. That's the sad thing. The prodigal came to himself. It wasn't too late, but he paid a terrible price. You know, we don't read the backside of that story. <laughs> he may have got back to daddy's house, but it wasn't daddy's house anymore. It was his big brother's house. Every meal he ate was on his big brother's kindness. Every piece of clothes he bought was on his, because he spent his inheritance. That's a message for another day, I guess. But some of us, 
And I'm not just talking about this church. I travel the length and breadth of our fellowship. Preached several camp meetings this year. And some of us need to come to ourselves before it's too late. Because there is a thief among us today. And he has great passion. He is your adversary. He is the devil. And your only hope is to resist him steadfast in the faith. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. As Bishop Mullins was ministering, this is what I felt. I felt like God is depositing within the confines of this place and those that are watching. He's depositing something that's going to change your life. You're talking and listening to a man here who is revered in many circles and even in our fellowship. But God has blessed him with the ability to see things and know things and to experience things and to have been through things. And all he's doing on this last journey, this is what I felt, is being poured out like a drink offering on congregations for a reason. Into the next generation, into the sustaining generation, to be able to do exactly what God wants to do. It's not a joke. It's not a game. We do have an adversary. We do have a thief. We do have an enemy. And the Lord is just saying, simply, who's on the Lord's side? I know you're under attack, but the way you'll be sustained is that you have to be on the Lord's side. Amen. So in a minute, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter if you're a visitor or you've been walking with God for a long time. But he's asking and he's drawing a line. And he's saying, who's on the Lord's side? Because the Lord is going to be your provider. He's going to be your sustainer. He's going to fight on your behalf. He's going to allow you to walk through storms and anything else that you're coming up against right now. He said, if you'll submit yourselves unto the Lord, then you can resist the devil and the devil will flee from you. But it's all based upon whose side you're on and who you're aligning with. And I believe that our bishop has poured something into this congregation and he's going to pour into others but thank God that he's personal with us pouring into us to take us to that next level today you can just make your way to the altar if you're on the Lord's side if you're not able to make it to the altar it doesn't mean that you're not on the Lord's side right where you're at make it in your mind and say I'm, I'm on the Lord's side I'm making my mind up today that I'm going to repent of all my sin. I'm going to turn from the way that I'm walking. I'm going to make a 180 degree turn in, in the confines of my mind. I'm going to repent. I'm going to have a radical change of mind. I'm going to start following Jesus now. I'm going to go into the waters of baptism and I'm going to take on his name because I'm on the Lord's side. I'm going to put on the family name. I'm going to don the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus upon me in the waters of baptism and have my sins washed away in the name of Jesus. I'm on the Lord's side and therefore the Lord is going to equip me with his spirit and he's going to fill me with it. I'm saying I'm on the Lord's side. Who's on the Lord's side? That's all he's asking today. There's some things that are given to you today in the spirit and as you come to this altar come beginning to pray and lift up your voices and begin to pray unto the Lord and intercede begin to pray until you break through in speaking in tongues it's okay because we're not given a message in tongues we're just praying in tongues right now begin to pray and intercede until you start fighting back the very forces of hell the spirit of God will begin to make intercession for you with words that cannot be spoken in any native language 
or any natural language that you know. Uh, the Spirit will make intercession for you with groanings that cannot be uttered uh, by your natural voice and, and by your language that you know. Uh, the Holy Ghost will begin to ensue uh, if you're in this place uh, and you're coming to the Lord uh, and you're giving Him your life. Uh, all you've got to do is begin to praise Him uh, with your own voice. Uh, begin to praise Him with your own mouth. Uh, begin to lift up the name of Jesus uh, and He's going to fill you with the baptism uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, he's going to fill you uh, to overflowing if you'll allow him and you'll begin to speak in another language another tongue that was given to you by God and you'll begin to speak as the spirit of God gives you the ability to speak it's okay it can be a glossolalia all across this place it can be a speaking in tongues that's beginning to break out all around here we are fighting against something we cannot see and the weapons of our warfare they're not carnal but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds they're mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds. We're not going to sift it through our natural mind. We're going to sift it through the God that we know that's able to battle and never lose. The one who's going to fight and fight on our behalf and always win in the name of Jesus. Oh God, we come to you right now. We receive the engrafted word that was preached today. Oh God, we receive the word with gladness because we know that God, it is the power of God unto us who believe in the name of Jesus. This word that we receive, Lord, we take it, Lord, when we're not just going to be hearers of the word, but we're going to be doers. And the enemy, your enemy, Lord, we put him under our feet where he belongs in the name of Jesus and by the authority of the word. We resist him because we're on your side. Lord, we trust that you're able to do the work through us in the name of Jesus. We can do nothing of ourselves, but we can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives us strength. That's it. Just begin to go a little bit deeper in prayer. Begin to intercede just a little longer. It may be the man next to you. It may be the woman next to you. It may be the young person next to you that needs your prayer and you're beginning to intercede. You're beginning to go a little deeper. That's it. You might be receiving the Holy Ghost right now as you're receiving it. Don't be afraid of what's happening to you. Just embrace what the Lord is wanting to do. He's trying to use you. He's trying to use you. He's trying to use you. And just close your eyes. And just close your eyes. And just focus on Jesus. And just put him in view. Put his word in view. You heard something today. The enemy is trying to come in like a flood. But the Lord is going to raise up a standard against him. He's going to raise up a standard against him. Or like a flood, the Lord is going to raise up a standard against him. Whatever way he's going to do it. He's going to do it according to his scripture, according to his spoken word, his written word. Oh, in the name of Jesus, the spirit of God is moving in this place and he's saying, come on, let's reason together. Who's on the Lord's side? There's something that's going to open up in the spirit and swallow up everything that's not on the Lord's side. It's going to begin to devour everything that's not on the Lord's side. It's going to begin to burn up everything that's not on the Lord's side. But the God of all gods is going to answer by fire in the name of Jesus. He's going to bring you out. He's going to lift you up. He's going to provide for you. He's going to direct you. He's going to cleanse you. He's going to save you. He's going to make you over and over again. He's going to give you the things that you have need of for the journey in the name of Jesus. The Lord God Almighty is moving in this place and he's calling you by name. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. He knows everything that you're struggling with right now. All you've got to do is say, Lord, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my soul. I'm giving you my allegiance. I'm giving everything to you. I'm going to trust you with all my heart. And I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge you. And you are going to direct my path. I'm going to be a Bible believer. But not just a Bible believer. I'm going to be a Bible follower. I'm going to do whatever it says. Jot and tittle. Every little asterisk. Every little thing in it. I'm going to embrace it with everything I have on the inside of me. In the name of Jesus. That's it. Call on his name. Call on his name. He said I'll rescue you. I'll save you. I'll bring you out with a strong hand. In the name of Jesus. The Lord is here today and he's deposited something
something through the man of God and he's given us something not just to chew on but something that will save our souls and keep us from falling and keep us in the faith and help us to endure all the hard places in the name of Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord this morning and be ye saved in the name of Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord this morning and be ye saved says the Lord. Il no romo shatara na maya, hikoromo shitetere meko.